Good morning, everyone, and welcome to worship here on Sunday, January 23, in uh, the year 2022. I'm Reverend John Smith, and it's my pleasure to be here to lead worship with you here this morning. I have George and Susan Brown in our video booth. Bert Jackson is reading our scripture, and Jenny Robinson will be offering music for us this morning. Just one announcement to highlight the uh, delay of our annual meeting, which was to be next Sunday. Uh, the council met last week and decided to postpone it to the first Sunday of March, which is March the 6th. And uh, our hope is that we'll be back in church by then and uh, we'll be able to have an in-person or maybe even a hybrid uh, meeting that day. As we light the Christ candle this morning, let us consider our intentions. Let us greet this day with hope and expectation. Let us greet this day as one which fills our lives with light. Let us greet this day as the first day of our forward movement. Let us intend to be light, to share light, and to give light in all we say and do. Amen. Our first hymn is God of the Bible from More Voices, number 28, God of the Bible. God said, I will no longer call you desolate. Instead, I will name you delight. Instead of the name deserted, you will know yourselves as joy. God's loving intention toward us fills us this morning with power and hope. God holds our future in our hands. God's love shows us the way. Let us now claim our inheritance as the people of delight. As we stand here today, fresh as the morning, the pathway opens before us, the fog lifts, and the way becomes clear. With joy and with delight, we greet this brand new day. Thanks be to God. Our opening prayer is a, a prayer with a, a response for you to say along with me at home. 
and it is very simple. Let us live joyfully. So that's how we begin. Let us pray. <clears throat> Let us live joyfully. Let us form a community of love in a world full of despair. Let us live without any kind of hatred. Let us live joyfully. Let us form a community of spiritual health in a world full of illness. Let us live without any kind of spiritual disease. Let us live joyfully. Let us form a community of peace in a world full of rivalry. Let us live without any kind of rivalry. Let us live joyfully. Let us form a community which possesses nothing. Let us live on spiritual bliss, radiating spiritual light. Let us live joyfully today and always. And that prayer was from the Dhammapada, which is a collection of uh, Hindu sayings and readings. Now, I just wanted to pause before we go too much further. It's, it's a new year, and we're just a little bit into the new year. And as we think about our community here at Port Elgin United Church, thinking about all that has gone before and all that will come uh, ahead of us, and the, the practice of setting intentions is well known and uh, discussed in many secular forums, but it's not something that we tend to spend a lot of time uh, on in church, which is a mistake on our part, because uh, intentions are not like, this is what I'm going to do today, and I intend to do it. I mean, that is one kind of intention, but an intention is more what is my heart and my spirit calling me to do? What is my heart and my spirit calling me to do? You can take that a little bit further at home um, after church today. If you want, take a moment of silence. Um, write down your intention. As you think about our community, ask the question, what is my heart and my spirit asking me to do? What is the purpose of my being here at this point in time in this community? And this brings us into alignment with God's purpose for our community. So I hope that you'll take a little bit of time with that today. And uh, you don't have to email me or phone me uh, with your answers because the thing is, if all of us set an intention based on our heart and spirit, it will happen. We can just trust that it's going to happen. I'd like to end this section with a prayer of the Dalai Lama. And you can say this along with me. <clears throat> I would be a protector for those without protection, a leader for those who journey, and a boat, a bridge, a passage for those desiring the further shore. I would be a lantern for those desiring light. I would be a bed for those needing rest. I would be a servant for those needing help. I would be for everyone a magic jewel, an inexhaustible jar, a universal remedy, a wishing tree, a cow, of plenty. As the earth and other elements are in various ways for the enjoyment of all beings, so may I be in various ways, sustenance and hope for all living beings. May it be so. Amen. Now our next uh, hymn or song is called <clears throat> Take, O oh, Take Me, as I am. And as Jenny is singing it for us, we're going to sing it through three times. I encourage you to sing along. But there's also uh, some movement uh, to go along with that. And so really just four movements. The first one is take, like this, just pulling to yourself. Take, oh, take me as I am. So take, oh, take me as I am. Summon out is a flat palm of your left hand and your right hand in the middle of it. Summon out. 
like that, being called out, summon out what I shall be, and then set your seal on my heart, goes like this. You take your left hand, splay it open like that, put it on your heart, and then you reach as if you're reaching into the stars and you pull that down and you put it in between those fingers right into your heart, right? Set your seal upon my heart and live, two L's, live in me. Okay, so take, oh take me as I am, <clears throat> Summon out what I shall be. Set your seal upon my heart and live in me. Today's first scripture reading is from Isaiah 62. For Zion's sake, I will not keep silent. For Jerusalem's sake, I will not remain quiet till her vindication shines out like the dawn, her salvation like a blazing torch. The nations will see your vindication and all your kings, your glory. You will be called by a new name that the mouth of the Lord will bestow. You will be a crown of splendor in the Lord's hand, a royal diadem in the hand of your God. No longer will they call you deserted or name your land desolate, but you will be called Hephzibah, and your land Beulah. For the Lord will take delight in you, and your land will be married. As a young man marries a young woman, so will your builder marry you. As a bridegroom rejoices over his bride, so will your God rejoice over you. The second reading is from John chapter 2. Three days later, there was a wedding in the village of Cana in Galilee. Jesus' mother was there. Jesus and his disciples were guests also. When they started running low on wine at the wedding banquet, Jesus' mother told him, they are just about out of wine. Jesus said, is that any of our business, mother, yours or mine? This isn't my time. Don't push me. She went ahead anyway, telling the servants, whatever he tells you, do it. 
six stoneware water pots were there, used by the Jews for ritual washings. Each held 20 to 30 gallons. Jesus ordered the servants, fill the pots with water, and they filled them to the brim. Now fill your pitchers and take them to the host, Jesus said, and they did. When the host tasted the water that had become wine, he didn't know what had just happened, but the servants, of course, knew. He called out to the bridegroom, Everybody I know begins with their finest wines, and after the guests have had their fill, brings in the cheap stuff. But you've saved the best until now. This act in Cana of Galilee was the first sign Jesus gave the first glimpse of his glory, and his disciples believed in him. Here ends the reading for today. Thank you, Jenny, and uh, thank you, Bert. Uh, I was thinking as we were singing that hymn that uh, that's one of those that everybody knows, and were we all together here in the sanctuary, we would be uh, joyfully singing that hymn. <clears throat> not yet. Soon, but not yet. About 500 years ago, a Spanish mystic by the name of Teresa, known now as Teresa de Villa, had a series of ecstatic visions. One that I particularly love is of an interior castle, an interior castle. And in that vision, as you encounter the depth of your own spiritual being, it is like descending the steps of a large mansion or castle within your own being. So descending the steps within your own being. In each of the rooms of the castle, the first six, there are lessons to learn and faith to grow. 
not unlike a more modern take on faith development, such as that of John Westerhoff or Eric Erickson. After you become comfortable at each level of the mansion, you finally get down to the seventh and final stage. As you stand on the landing, ready to enter that final room of your spiritual development, you pause. You pause for a moment. You think you know what you're going to see on the other side of the door, but you're not quite sure. But your heart, as you open the door, fills with the deep light of the room. And it is, as you thought it would be, the light of God, but not just the light of God, the source of the universe. You realize that it's not just the light of God, but it's also the light of you, that you become one with the light of God. That source, that source of the universe is in you, and you awaken to this stunning realization. As in Teresa's vision, when you get to that seventh and final stage, you get into a state of pure conscious awareness. You are one with the source, and the source is one with you. And you quickly realize that the first six levels of your spiritual journey, as important as they had been, were all just leading you to the final step, the inner chamber of the inner castle. Now, in modern days, uh, many people have spoken of this in different language, of course, modern idioms. Wayne Dyer was one of those who spoke of it often. He taught that the power of the source is always with us and can be found within us. And when we learn to align ourselves with that source, then the power of it, the creative, always expanding energy of that source uh, will be manifest in you. So it's always there, always has been there, but most of us live our lives completely unaware of it or not wanting to, to know too much about it because we're a little bit af afraid of it. Dyer spoke of intention this way. He said that most of us think of intention kind of like a pit bull. My intention today, we might say, is to get through my hundred emails and we go at it like a pit bull until we're finished and then whew, we're finished. But a real intention Wayne Dyer said, comes from putting yourself inside the power of the inner light that lives in you. It's about learning what the divine light in you wants you to be. Malika Chopra, <clears throat> who's the daughter of Deepak Chopra, said that intention is not a set of goals which are task-oriented, like a checklist of things that you want to do or get done. Rather, intention is who we aspire to be. Who we aspire to be. And she described a meaningful conversation that she'd had with Eckhart Tolle, who said that everyday people are the ones that the universe needs, right? Not special, sacred, holy people, but everyday people like you and me are the ones who are being called upon in this time in which we live to get with our inner being and grow the capacity to, in Eckhart Tolle's terminology, to change the energy of the earth, to change the energy of the planet. And when you put it that way, it's kind of exciting. Imagine being on the inside of changing the energy of the planet because the power of the source working its way in us is, is always directed towards forward movement, always directed towards change and growth. And interestingly enough, the moment we pay attention to it is when the energy starts to shift. We can feel that inside our own beings. When we surrender to the powerful energy of the source of wisdom, whom we might call God, but we don't have to, but most of us would, and when we surrender to this source, we find 
that we already have it in us, that the energy of the whole universe, believe it or not, is available to us right now in this moment. I don't know about you, but when I consider that I have inside of me the energy of the whole universe, I, well, I'm excited because I realize I have way more power than I ever thought I ever had. Without putting too fine a point on it, can I suggest that if we really want to grow our church or to heal our church's spirit or to figure out what the very next steps are for us as a church here in Port Elgin, Ontario, then it's important to remember we already have the power and the energy and the source of all of light right here with us. If we could just align ourselves with it, think what we could do, right? Think how we could change the energy of the planet. So this is because the source intends things and uses us to accomplish beautiful things. The source is an always creating power, always intending new life to come forth, to uh, bring growth and beauty, always on the side of hope and transformation. And so, it means that this moment right now, as I'm speaking it and as you are hearing it at whatever time you are hearing it in your own home, this moment right now is the same as standing on the threshold of that door to the seventh room of the interior castle. And as we are touching that door handle, getting ready to access that last seventh chamber of light, that power is sitting there already waiting for us to open the door. As Wayne Dyer wrote so many times, the question is not, are you connected to the power of source of light, uh, sorry, to the source of light and energy and love? The question is, how rusty or corroded is your link? Right? It's not that we aren't connected. How rusty is our link? <clears throat> now here's a thought experiment for you. If you have an orange in your hand, and I'm not going to actually do this, but if you were to squeeze it, you would get all the juice out of it. You get the essence of orange uh, out of the orange, correct? But most of us, when life squeezes us, we get angry or hurt. We get angry when someone is angry with us. We become unkind when someone is unkind to us. We turn our backs on those who may have done their best for... We become unloving because we feel we're not loved. And so when life squeezes us rather hard, which it often does, does our pure essence come out? Or have we accessed it or perhaps buried it. If we align ourselves with the intention of God, the source, we begin to realize that when we judge someone or are angry with someone, it doesn't have any effect on the person that we're angry with or that we're judging. It shows us instead that we are the ones who are not in alignment not connected to our source energy, denying that the source of light and love wants nothing for us except light and love. William Blake said, if the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear as it is, infinite. If the doors of perception were cleansed, everything would appear to us as it is, which is infinite. But man has closed himself up till he sees all things only through the chinks in his cavern. So my friends, let's understand 
that the spiritual life requires an ongoing commitment to alignment with the source, that there are moments of decision and commitment that come to us, sometimes big moments, right? Big moments come to us when we know we have to turn that handle on that door, or smaller moments of decision and discernment that come to us every day. These things come to us every day, and it requires our intention to fulfill our purpose as people of the source. Well, let's talk for a moment about our scripture reading for this week. In this scripture reading, the wedding at Cana, Jesus displays this uh, connection to the source And he he expresses this all through the Gospel of John. John's Gospel is known as the Book of Signs, and in each one of the signs, Jesus expresses this connection that he has to the source of life and love. And it seems to me that there's always a moment, we might call it a pregnant pause or a little bit of indecision in each of these signs. And just before he brings the transformation to life, or just before he heals someone in the situation, there seems to be a little moment of discernment. But in today's parlance, let's call it alignment. There seems to be a moment of alignment. And it's kind of awesome that he does this because It helps us to see that uh, the greatest human being who ever lived was careful to align his intentions with his purpose every single day, right? Every, Every time he was called upon to do something, it seems like he took the moment to to think about who am I and what is my purpose. And so in the story of the wedding at Cana, you know, such a familiar story, we all know it. <clears throat> we can imagine this moment. It is the moment just before the wine is served. His mother, Mary, wants him to do something to help out the host of the wedding, and he gets mad at her. It's not time. You can hear him hissing to her in the corner of the reception room. But When isn't the time right for source energy to transform our lives, we might ask? And the story goes on. There are six stone jars there. Now, these stone jars are representative symbols because wine is a symbol of God's blessing and God's favor. It's not a stretch to imagine here that John, the gospel writer, is making a point about the spiritual life of the people of the day, that the wine had run out, that the jars were empty, and that the feast couldn't continue in its present form. I mean, if you think about it, was John talking about actual stone jars, or was he really talking about the empty hearts of the people of the day. The connection to the source had become rusty and corroded. In our day, the story is very relevant. There's a sense of emptiness, a weariness, a sense that we really don't know what the future holds. Within Christianity, a sense that perhaps our days are waning, that nobody is buying what we're selling. But that can't possibly be true, by the way. If the Christian faith were to get serious about becoming more connected to the source again, but that's another whole sermon. <clears throat> and as I said last week, our, our kids don't seem to want the stories that we tell. And they might look at our faith as a kind of quaint throwback to simpler times. They would probably look at today's reading, this turning of water into wine, you know, with the skepticism of science and say that there's no way six jars of water could ever be turned into wine. If I have to believe in stuff like that, they might say, and I'm not going to believe any of it. Hey, maybe some of you even feel the same way. To me, the six jars are like Teresa Davila's inner journey 
through the six rooms of growth and enlightenment, and now standing on the threshold of the seventh chamber, the presence of the Christ light will be revealed. Surely that is what ha is happening here in John. The wine steward fills the jars with water, not wine, and Jesus now standing at that door with his hand on the handle has a decision to make, right? Is it true, he may be thought, is it true that there really is eternal light in my own being, in my own heart? Is it true that the source of light and love will be there when I give my life over to it? He opens the door. He opens the door, <clears throat> and the water becomes wine. His faith, his life, his purpose is transformed as water might turn into wine. So, <clears throat> friends, the, the meaning of this story is, is really not for Jesus or about Jesus. He, he already knew who he was, right? When, when John sat down to write the stories of Jesus, he wasn't doing it for Jesus, because Jesus was long gone. He was doing it for us, for we who would read it later. And so um, <clears throat> Jesus already lived his life connected to the source of light within, and he already knew what his purpose was, which I think was to shine the light. And he already knew that he was called to bring others to that light and to open that door and to help transform people's lives, to discover the wine of the presence of God in our lives. You see, this story is about our journey, how we are called at different moments to open that door or to be willing to become intoxicated with the very real power and energy that can flow into our hearts and then through our hearts back out into the world. The story is about how empty and emptied out our hearts have become in this world with threats of war, with never-ending pandemic regulations, with all the accompanying isolation and loneliness that has come along with it and had been imp have been imposed on so many, when religions themselves seem to have gone dry, when people look everywhere for anything that will soothe the pain, when people will search through any kind of spiritual practice or through classes online or even magic mushrooms I hear are popular again or some other drug just to either dull the pain or to find peace. We look everywhere and we try everything we can to avoid the obvious, that our connection to the source has become rusty and corroded. So this is what the story reveals to us, that there are moments like now in the life of this congregation Moments where we find ourselves standing on the threshold of new things or of making important decisions. There are moments when we realize that our own hurt or anger or disapp disappointment or maybe our own lack of compassion or maybe our desperate desire for love or kindness in our lives should force us to stop and consider the next step. And these steps are there for us to consider how connected we are to the source of light and love. Yes, we can turn away. Yes, we might get to that door and say, no, I don't want that. It's all just some kind of bunk. Or we could take another step in alignment and become a little more of who you are intended to be. That's the spiritual journey, friends. It's worth every difficulty if it gets you to that door. That moment 
just before you make that decision is a holy moment. It's a holy moment. When we grasp the spiritual meaning of this story, we can see the obvious conclusion. We're standing at the door with a bottle of water, hoping and praying we can turn it into wine. If we trust in the source, we already know what the answer will be. In that moment, that holy moment, we become aware that the clay jar is you. That the clay jar is you. And that the wine, the source of love and light, is you transformed. May it be so. Amen. Water into wine, water into wine, he changed my life. Like water into wine He filled me up With his grace and love He changed my life Like water into wine Water into wine Water into wine He changed my life Wow.
changed my life like water into wine. He filled me up with his grace and his love. He changed my life like water into wine. He changed my That was awesome. Thank you. I've, I've now changed and rearranged. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Jenny. Let's bow our heads in prayer. <clears throat> in our prayers, let us open our hearts to one another and to this community in which we find ourselves and to the world around us. Let us open our hearts to the beauty of the wind, the sound of the frozen lake, the beauty of the blue jay's cry calling for praise or food or life. Even the crows that wake us up in the morning, let us be grateful that we are awake. Let us hear the call of those who are sick or lonely in our families, in our circles of care, calling for company or comfort, the presence of God's Spirit. Their calls remind us that we are in community together. Let us be grateful that we have people in our lives who need us and want us. God, let us hear the call from within our own souls, calling for purpose, for belonging, for assurance. Our own inner spirits call us to listen to who we really are. Let us be grateful for these moments of awareness. Let us hear the call of those who have suffered or are in pain or trauma of some kind. Let us hear those calling for respect or affirmation, calling for help with homelessness or for food. Let us hear the call of those who have been hurt, who long for mercy whose hearts are broken. Let us be grateful that love and forgiveness and compassion already live within our source. As we gather this morning, let us be mindful of the essence of life which runs in us and through us and the freedoms that we have to express who we are here in this church in our jobs, in our families, in our circles. Let us hear a call to take the blessing to others, not to shine the light only on ourselves, but to spread it to those in need. We pray in Jesus' name, who taught us to pray, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. <coughs> now our last hymn, Take My Life and Let It Be. and 
So friends, as we go forth today, let us go with the light of Christ shining forth from our being. May the light of Christ go before us. May the light of Christ be behind us. May the light of Christ be above us and below us. May the light of Christ be to our left and to our right. And may we see the light of Christ in everyone we meet this day and forever. Amen. Steadfast, strong, and true. No.